Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with more Robert Fortune. Welcome to the China Vintage Hour. We're part of the Teacup Media Empire. In today's selection, we're continuing on with more from Robert Fortune's 1847 work, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. Today, we're treated to Robert Fortune's observations sailing down the Pearl River near Canton, his visits to temples near Ningbo, and his thoughts about Buddhism. In addition to Fortune's encounters with Buddhist monks and priests, we're treated to his adventures, mixing with some of the local toughs rolling up on him and trying to rip him off and meet out some bodily injury. This was 1844. Foreigners, though new to most parts of China outside of Guangdong province, already had acquired somewhat of a bad name thanks to the harsh terms of the Treaty of Nanjing, as well as their heavy-handed ways and unwillingness to do things in a way that respected basic Chinese sensibilities. Our narrator continues on in this piece about his outrage at how the Chinese treated him and other foreigners. But again, you'll hear loudly and clearly from Fortune's tone, his sometimes contempt for Chinese ways. And you'll probably notice Fortune commits the same unpardonable offense of gross generalizations about what he saw, and applying that to all of China and the Chinese. Mind you, this was only his first trip to China, and though he had traveled more than most foreigners, eh, it's always a bit of a hoot to me to hear how some people take a little bit of knowledge and speak as if they held a Ph.D. and four honorary degrees on the subject. Well, if RF was trying to puff himself up a bit about how much he knew about China, he certainly wasn't the last China expert to do so. So let's get on with today's passage of the China Vintage Hour, brought to you by Teacup Media. We're in the year 1844, an election year here in the United States. James K. Polk was running against Henry Clay. Well, here we go. As the island of Zhou Shan was my headquarters in the north of China, I now proceeded thither with my collections from Shanghai, preparatory to sailing for Hong Kong and the southern ports of the country. The Zhoshan Hills were now covered with snow, and the weather was piercingly cold. Large quantities of pheasants and waterfowl were daily brought to the markets by the Chinese, who found the English good customers. A small species of deer was also brought from the mainland and frequently alive. Four or five fine pheasants were often to be purchased for a dollar, and duck and teal were also remarkably cheap. I believe from two to four rupees were generally given for a deer. The officers of the troops stationed at Zhou Shan, who were fond of shooting, obtained excellent sport by engaging Chinese boats and going across to the hills on the mainland, there being little game of any kind upon the island itself. Having got all my things packed, I took a passage in a vessel bound for the south, and having a fair monsoon down the China Sea, we arrived at Hong Kong in a few days, without anything occurring worthy of notice. The various collections which I had made in the north were now put up in glazed cases and shipped for England. As the south of China had been ransacked by former botanists, I could not expect to find much which was new or worthy of being sent home, and I therefore arranged to proceed north again in March or April in order to have a whole season before me. In the meantime, as I had a few weeks to spare in the south, I determined on a visit to Canton and Macau, which are both within a short distance from Hong Kong. The Canton River is certainly one of the most imposing and striking objects which the traveler meets with in this celebrated country. The sea near its mouth is studded all over with numerous islands, of which a good view is obtained in going over from Hong Kong to Macau and in sailing from either of these places to Canton. We pass a succession of them, most of which are mountainous, having huge masses of rock and yellow gravelly clay protruding here and there through the surface, but thinly covered with vegetation of any kind. Sometimes, however, in our progress, we obtained views of beautiful bays with a few acres of level land near the shore, in the midst of which there are some pretty houses or huts surrounded by a few trees and shrubs. In sailing amongst these islands, one is apt to think that in the retirement of such places, far removed from the vicious world and the busy hum of men, the inhabitants must indeed be happy and innocent, having their few wants abundantly supplied by the rice which grows luxuriantly around their dwellings, and by the never-failing supply of excellent fish which are easily caught in the sea. 
But these dreams of happiness and innocence are soon dispelled. These quiet villages abound with pirates who frequently commit acts of the most cold-blooded cruelty and render the passage between Hong Kong, Canton, and Macau an alarming and dangerous affair. Lorches and other small vessels with valuable cargoes on board are frequently attacked, the crew and passengers murdered, and the vessels disabled or destroyed. A few hours sail with a fair wind and tide brought me in sight of the celebrated Boca Tigris, the entrance to the Canton River. The forts destroyed during the war had been rebuilt on a more extensive scale, and, if manned with English soldiers, no hostile fleet in the world could pass them without being blown to pieces. I fancy, however, that the Chinese, although they have had a lesson in the art of war, which will make them more difficult to conquer in future, would still, with all their forts, afford but a feeble resistance against the military and naval tactics of the English and other civilized nations of the West. Inside the Bogue, the river widens very much and presents the appearance of an inland sea. The view now becomes beautiful and highly picturesque, the flat, cultivated land near the shores forming a striking contrast to the barren hills on the outside of the forts. The mountains in the distance appear to encircle the extensive plain, and although, like the others, they are barren, yet they make a fine background to the picture. A few miles further up the river, the shipping in Blenheim and Wampoa reaches come into view, and the celebrated Wampoa Pagoda, with several more of less note, besides numerous other towers and joss houses, all remind the traveler that he is approaching the far-famed city of Canton one of the richest and most important in the Celestial Empire. The noble river, with its numerous ramifications, forms many islands, on one of which the small town or village of Wampoa is built. After having been several months in the north of China, and, with one or two exceptions, always experiencing the greatest civility from the natives, I was beginning to form a high opinion of the Chinese as a nation, and inclined to trust the people about Canton in the same manner as I had done in the northern provinces. I very soon, however, found out my mistake, and in a most disagreeable manner. There were some hills behind the city, a few miles distant, which I had often wished to visit for the purpose of examining their botanical productions. One morning, I started off through the town in the direction of these hills, and after walking between two and three miles, I reached the suburbs on the side of the town, opposite to that where the foreign factory stands. The sounds of Fangui with which I was assailed in the early part of my walk, had now nearly ceased, and I began to imagine that I had got out from amongst the impertinent boys and low Chinese whom one continually meets in the back streets of Canton. I was now on a good road, amongst fields and gardens, and had an excellent view of the surrounding country and hills. How very strange, thought I, that the foreign residents and the factories never avail themselves of the opportunity of coming here when they might enjoy the fresh air and see the country, which would help to relieve the monotonous life they are compelled to lead. As I was walking quietly along, I met a Chinese soldier on horseback, who by gestures and words did everything in his power to induce me to retrace my steps. I knew nothing of the Canton dialect at this time, and... As I thought he only wished to prevent me from taking a walk in the country, I paid no attention to him, but passed onwards. Soon afterwards, however, I began to suspect the ill intentions of several groups of ill-looking fellows who seemed to be eyeing me narrowly as I proceeded. I now came to a little hill which seemed to be used as a cemetery. It was enclosed, but the door which led to it was wide open, and the place appeared to be quite public. In order to have a more extended view of the country, I walked in and began to ascend the hill. I had only proceeded about halfway up when a number of Chinamen who had followed me in began to crowd round me, asking for cumshaws, and becoming every moment more numerous and urgent. I tried what civility would do with them for a little while, but by the time I reached the top of the hill, I clearly perceived that I was in a trap out of which it would be a difficult matter to extricate myself. Up to this time, however, no one had attempted to lay hands upon me. Taking a cursory view of the surrounding country, I began to devise, in my mind, the best mode of getting rid of my troublesome companions. There seemed no other way than putting a bold face on the matter and retracing my steps to Canton. "'You more better come down this way,' said a fellow to me in broken English, pointing to a ravine on the opposite side of the hill. 
My suspicions, however, were now roused, and I saw at once the object of my adviser, which was to get me into some place out of sight, where I should doubtless have been robbed of every article I had about my person, and probably stripped into the bargain. No, no, said I, I have nothing to do down there, and began to retrace my steps down the hill. The Chinese now closed upon me, and seemed determined to obstruct my progress. Some laid hold of my arms. One fellow seized my cap and ran off with it. Another did the same with my umbrella. Several hands were in my pockets, and others were even attempting to get my coat off. I now saw that nothing short of getting everything I possessed would satisfy them, as each one wanted something, and their name was Legion. Collecting all my strength, I threw myself upon those who were below me and set several of them rolling down the side of the hill. This, however, was nearly fatal to me, for owing to the force which I exerted and the uneven nature of the ground, I stumbled and fell, but fortunately I instantly recovered myself and renewed the unequal struggle, my object being to reach the door of the cemetery by which I had entered. The Chinese on the hill now called out to their friends below to shut the door and thus prevent me from reaching the open road. Seeing at once that if this were accomplished I should be an easy prey to them, I determined, if possible, to prevent it. Springing out of the grasp of those by whom I was surrounded, I made for the door, which I reached just as it was closed, but fortunately before it was fastened on the other side. The force with which I came against it burst it open and threw the Chinamen on their backs who were busily fastening it. I was now in the open road where some hundreds of the Chinese were congregated together. Some of them apparently respectable, but the greater part, evidently, nothing but thieves and robbers. The respectable part would not, or probably durst not, render me any assistance. Stones were now flying about me in all directions, and a brick struck me with a great force on the back and nearly brought me to the ground. I was stunned for a few seconds and leaned against the wall to breathe and recover myself, thinking that I was now comparatively safe as I was out in the open road. I was soon undeceived, however, for the rascals again surrounded me and relieved me of several articles which had escaped them before. As the whole neighborhood was evidently a bad one, it would have been madness to have taken shelter in any of the houses, and I therefore had to struggle with the robbers for nearly a mile, sometimes fighting and sometimes running until I got out of their territory and near the more populous parts of the town. The plight I was now in may easily be conceived, but taking everything into account, I came off better than might have been expected. On my way home, having neither hat nor umbrella, I suffered greatly from exposure to the sun, which, in the south of China, is very powerful on a clear day, even in spring. I would have gladly gone into a shop and bought a Chinese hat, but the rascals had not left me even a copper cash for the purpose. Fortunately, I had left my watch at home. Otherwise, that would have been taken amongst the first things, as Chinese thieves are very partial to watches and know their value well. The Honorable F.C. Drummond, with whom I was staying at the time, informed me afterwards that the place where I had been attacked was one of the worst in the suburbs of Canton, and that three gentlemen of his acquaintance, a year or two before, had come off even worse than I had done. The Chinese haven't taken away nearly all their clothes. About two years after this attack upon me, Three gentlemen holding government appointments in China, Mr. Montgomery Martin, the Reverend V. Stanton, and Mr. Jackson, having incautiously strolled into the suburbs, were also attacked, and the letter which they addressed officially to Her Majesty's Consul, complaining of the treatment they had received, shows so clearly the state of things at Canton that I give it entire. Quote, About seven o'clock this morning, while walking for exercise along the north wall on the outside of the city, we were attacked by several Chinese who had been following us and increasing in numbers from the building known to foreigners as the Five-Storied Pagoda. At first they commenced by throwing stones, which endangered our lives and by some of which we were struck. This attack was aided and encouraged by a number of Chinese who followed us along the top of the city wall, hurling large stones which, if they had struck, would have killed those at whom they were aimed. Mr. Jackson was first attacked by men brandishing swords and daggers. His arms were pinioned and his gold chain snatched from his neck. The Reverend Mr. Stanton and Mr. Martin, perceiving that Mr. Jackson was not following, returned to aid him and were themselves seized. One of the assailants thrust a dagger at Mr. Martin's breast. Two endeavored to throw him on the ground, and while struggling with them, his pockets were rifled. The same, of course, was pursued with Mr. Jackson and Mr. Stanton. 
The latter lost his watch, the former still retained his, but everything else was taken. The assailants then left us, but the persons on the wall followed us for some time, hurling large stones and using menacing gestures and opprobrious language. Proceeding southward beneath the wall to reach to the other side, we were again followed and attacked by another party. Mr. Jackson received a violent blow on his chest, and a roof was torn up to furnish large sticks to the assailants. In this attack, Mr. Jackson was deprived of his watch, our clothes were torn, and at one time the people were disposed to strip us. No resistance was offered. It was hopeless to have attempted it, not only by reason of the numbers and weapons of the multitude, but also on account of the attack on us from the watchtower and along the walls. The outrage was entirely unprovoked. Our own official character, in the presence of a minister of religion, was a guarantee for peaceful conduct, and had his presence not restrained Mr. Jackson and Mr. Martin, bloodshed might probably have ensued. Reaching a more populous part of the suburbs, we rested a moment and then proceeded home, but not unfrequently hearing opprobrious epithets mingled with cries of, "'Kill them! Kill them!' From no nation in Europe would British subjects suffer this treatment. There can be no excuse for tolerating a continuance of such conduct towards us in China, and we think there cannot be a doubt that the Chinese government have it in their power effectually to put a stop, not only to the personal insults which the English daily experience, but also to prohibit effectually the repetition of the injuries we have experienced. By the prohibition to enter the city of Canton, the lower classes of the Chinese are encouraged to regard us as inferiors and to treat us with marked contumely. No measures that we are aware of have ever been taken by the authorities to prevent the constant insults to which the British community are subjected and which, instead of diminishing by time, are being subdued by acts of kindness, seem to become more frequent and more virulent, anxiously desirous to maintain peace and to promote amity. We make this representation believing that, unless the Chinese authorities remedy the evils complained of, the most serious consequences must inevitably and ere long ensue. End quote. Having dispatched my collections to England by three different vessels from Hong Kong, I sailed again at the end of March, 1844, for the northern provinces. During the summer of this year, and in that of 1845, I was able to visit several parts of the country which were formerly sealed to Europeans and which contained subjects of much interest. About the beginning of May, I set out upon an excursion with Mr. Tom, the British consul, and two other gentlemen to visit the Green Tea District near Ningbo. We were informed that there was a large and celebrated temple named Tian Tong in the center of the Tea District, and about 20 miles distant where we could lodge during our stay in this part of the country. Twelve or fourteen miles of our journey was performed by water, but the canal ending at the foot of the hills, we were obliged to walk or take chairs for the remainder of the way. The mountain traveling chair of China is a very simple contrivance. It consists merely of two long bamboo poles with a board placed between them for a seat and two other cross pieces, one for the back and the other for the feet. A large Chinese umbrella is held over the head to afford protection from the sun and rain. The Chinese are quite philosophers after their own fashion. On our way to the temple, when tired with sitting so long in our boat, we several times got out and walked along the path on the sides of the canal. A great number of passage boats going in the same direction with ourselves and crowded with passengers kept very near us for a considerable portion of the way in order to satisfy their curiosity. A Chinaman never walks when he can possibly find any other mode of conveyance, and these persons were consequently much surprised to see us apparently enjoying our walk. Is it not strange, said one, that these people prefer walking when they have a boat as well as ourselves? A discussion now took place amongst them as to the reason of this apparently strange propensity, when one, more wise than his companions, settled the matter by the pithy observation, it is their nature to do so which was apparently satisfactory to all parties. It was nearly dark when we reached the temple, and as the rain had fallen in torrents during the greater part of the day, we were drenched to the skin and in rather a pitiable condition. The priests seemed much surprised at our appearance, but at once evinced the greatest hospitality and kindness, and we soon found ourselves quite at home amongst them. They brought us fire to dry our clothes, got ready our dinner, and set apart a certain number of their best rooms for us to sleep in. We were evidently subjects of great curiosity to most of them who had never seen an Englishman before. 
Our clothes, features, mode of eating, and manners were all subjects of wonder to these simple people, who passed off many a good-humored joke at our expense. Glad to get off our clothes, which were still damp, we retired early to rest. When we arose in the morning, the view which met our eyes far surpassed in beauty any scenery which I have ever witnessed before in China. The temple stands at the head of a fertile valley in the bosom of the hills. This valley is well watered by clear streams which flow from the mountains and produces most excellent crops of rice. The tea shrubs with their dark green leaves are seen dotted on the lower sides of all the more fertile hills. The temple itself is approached by a long avenue of Chinese pine trees. This avenue is at first straight, but near the temple it winds into a most picturesque manner round the edges of two artificial lakes, and then ends in a flight of stone steps which lead up to the principal entrance. Behind and on each side, the mountains rise in irregular ridges from one to two thousand feet above the level of the sea. These are not like the barren southern mountains, but are clothed nearly to their summits with a dense, tropical-looking mass of brushwood, shrubs, and trees. Some of the finest bamboos of China are grown in the ravines, and the somber-colored pine attains to a large size on the sides of the hills. Here, too, I observed some very beautiful specimens of the new fir, Cryptomeria japonica, and obtained some plants and seeds of it, which may now be seen growing in the horticultural gardens at Chiswick. After we had breakfasted, one of the head priests came and gave us a very pressing invitation to dine with him about midday, and in the meantime he accompanied us over the monastery of which he gave the following history. Quote, Many hundred years ago a pious old man retired from the world and came to dwell in these mountains, giving himself up entirely to the performance of religious duties. So earnest was he in his devotions that he neglected everything related to his temporal wants, even to his daily food. Providence, however, would not suffer so good a man to starve. Some boys were sent in a miraculous manner, who daily supplied him with food. In the course of time, the fame of the sage extended all over the adjacent country, and disciples flocked to him from all quarters. A small range of temples was built, and thus commenced the extensive buildings which now bear the name of Tiantong, or the Temple of the Heavenly Boys. Tian signifying heaven, and Tong a boy. At last the old man died, but his disciples supplied his place. The fame of the temple spread far and wide, and votaries came from the most distant parts of the empire, one of the Chinese kings being amongst the number, to worship and leave their offerings at its altars. Larger temples were built in front of the original ones, and these again in their turn gave way to those spacious buildings which form the principal part of the structure of the present day. All the temples are crowded with idols or images of their favorite gods, such as the three precious Buddhas, the Queen of Heaven, represented as sitting on the celebrated lotus or nilumbium, the God of War, and many other deified kings and great men of former days. Many of these images are from 30 to 40 feet in height and have a very striking appearance when seen arranged in these spacious and lofty halls. The priests themselves reside in a range of low buildings erected at right angles with the different temples and courts which divide them. Each has a little temple in his own house, a family altar crowded with small images, where he is often engaged in private devotion. After inspecting the various temples and the belfry, which contains a noble bronze bell of large dimensions, our host conducted us back to his house, where the dinner was already on the table. The priests of the Buddhist religion are not allowed to eat animal food at any of their meals. Our dinner, therefore, consisted entirely of vegetables, served up in the usual Chinese style in a number of small, round basins, the contents of each, soups excepted, being cut up into small, square bits to be eaten with chopsticks. The Buddhist priests contrived to procure a number of vegetables of different kinds, which, by a peculiar mode of preparation, are rendered very palatable. In fact... So nearly do they resemble animal food in taste and in appearance, that at first we were deceived, imagining that the little bits we were able to get hold of with our chopsticks were really pieces of fowl or beef. Such, however, was not the case, as our good host was consistent on this day at least, and had nothing but vegetable productions at his table. Several other priests sat with us at table, and a large number of others of inferior rank with servants crowded around the doors and windows outside, 
The whole assemblage must have been much surprised at the awkward way in which some of us handled our chopsticks, and, with all their politeness, I observed they could not refrain from laughing when, after repeated attempts, some little dainty morsel would still slip back again into the dish. I know few things more annoying, and yet laughable, too, than attempting to eat with the Chinese chopsticks for the first time. More particularly, if the operator has been wandering on the hills all the morning and is ravenously hungry. The instruments should, first of all, be balanced between the thumb and forefinger of the right hand. The points are next to be brought carefully together, just leaving as much room as will allow the coveted morsel to go in between them. The little bit is then to be neatly seized, but alas... In the act of lifting the hand, one point of the chopstick too often slips past the other, and the object of all our hopes drops back again into the dish, or perhaps even into another dish on the table. Again and again, the same operation is tried until the poor novice loses all patience, throws down the chopsticks in despair, and seizes a porcelain spoon, with which he is more successful. In cases like these, the Chinese themselves are very obliging, although scarcely in a way agreeable to an Englishman's taste. Your Chinese friend, out of kindness and politeness, when he sees the dilemma in which you are, reaches across the table and seizes with his own chopsticks, which have just come out of his mouth, the wished-for morsel, and with them lays it on the plate before you. In common politeness, you must express your gratitude and swallow the offering. During dinner, our host informed us that there were about a hundred priests connected with the monastery, but that many were always absent on missions to various parts of the country. On questioning him as to the mode by which the establishment was supported, he informed us that a considerable portion of land in the vicinity belonged to the temple, and that large sums were yearly raised from the sale of bamboos, which are here very excellent, and of the branches of trees and brushwood, which are made up in bundles for firewood. A number of tea and rice farms also belong to the priests, which they themselves cultivate. Besides the sums raised by the sale of these productions, a considerable revenue must be derived from the contributions of the devotees who resort to the temple for religious purposes, as well as from the sums collected by those of the order who are out on begging excursions at stated seasons of the year. The priests are, of course, of all grades, some of them being merely the servants of the others, both in the house and in the fields. They seem a harmless and simple race, but are dreadfully ignorant and superstitious. The typhoon of the previous year, or rather the rain which had accompanied it, had occasioned a large slip of earth on one of the hillsides near the temple, and completely buried ten or twelve acres of excellent paddy land. On our remarking this, the priest told us with great earnestness that everyone said it was a bad omen for the temple, but one of them, with true Chinese politeness, remarked that he had no doubt any evil influence would now be counteracted, since the temple had been honored with a visit from us. After inspecting the tea farms and the mode of manufacturing it, Mr. Tom, Mr. Morrison, a son of the late Dr. Morrison, and Mr. Sinclair returned to Ningbo, leaving me to prosecute my research in natural history in this part of the country. I was generally absent from the temple the whole day, returning at dark with the collections of plants and birds which I had been lucky enough to meet with in my peregrinations. The friends of the priests came from all quarters of the adjacent country to see the foreigner, and, as in the case of a wild animal, my feeding time seemed to be the most interesting moment to them. My dinner was placed on a round table in the center of the room, and although rather curiously concocted, being half Chinese and half English, the exercise and fresh air of the mountains gave me a keen appetite. The difficulties of the chopsticks were soon got over, and I was able to manage them nearly as well as the Chinese themselves. The priests and their friends filled the chairs, which are always placed down the sides of a Chinese hall, each man with his pipe in his mouth and his cup of tea by his side. With all the deference to my host and his friends, I was obliged to request the smoking to be stopped, as it was disagreeable to me while at dinner. In other respects, I believe I was polite enough. I shall never forget how inexpressibly lonely I felt the first night after the departure of my friends. The Chinese, one by one, dropped off to their homes or to bed, and at last my host himself gave several unequivocal yawns, which reminded me that it was time to retire for the night. My bedroom was upstairs, and to get to it I had to pass through a small temple, such as I have already noticed, dedicated to Tian Ho, or the Queen of Heaven, and crowded with other idols. Incense was burning on the altar in front of the idols. A solitary lamp shed a dim light over the objects in the room, and a kind of solemn stillness seemed to pervade the whole place. 
In the room below, and also in one in an adjoining house, I could hear the priests engaged in their devotional exercises, in that singing tone which is peculiar to them. Then the sounds of the gong fell upon my ears, and at intervals a single solemn toll of the large bronze bell in the belfry, all which showed that the priests were engaged in public as well as private devotion. Amid scenes of this kind in a strange country, far from friends and home, impressions are apt to be made upon the mind, which remain vivid through life, and I feel convinced I shall never forget the strange mixture of feelings which filled my mind during the first night of my stay with the priests in the temple of Tiantong. I have visited the place often since, passed through the same little temple, slept in the same bed, and heard the same solemn sounds throughout the silent watches of the night, and yet the first impressions remain in my mind, distinct and single. The priests, from the highest to the lowest, always showed me the most marked attention and kindness. As many of them, as I wished, cheerfully followed me in my excursions in the vicinity of the temple, one carrying my specimen paper, another my plants, and a third my birds, and so on. The gun seemed an object of great interest to them, being so different from their own clumsy matchlocks, and percussion caps were looked upon as most magical little objects. But they were great cowards and always kept at a most respectful distance when I was shooting. One evening, a deputation, headed by the high priest, came and informed me that the wild boars had come down from the mountains at night and were destroying the young shoots of the bamboo, which were then just coming through the ground, and were in the state in which they are highly prized as a vegetable for the table. Well, said I, what do you want me to do? Will you be good enough to lend us the gun? Yes, there it stands in the corner of the room. Oh, but you must load it for us. Very well, I will. And I immediately loaded the gun with ball. There, but take care and don't shoot yourselves. There was now a long pause. None had sufficient courage to take the gun, and a long consultation was held between them. At length, the spokesman came forward with great gravity and told me they were afraid to fire it off, but that if I would go with them and shoot the boar, I should have it to eat. This was certainly no great sacrifice on the part of the Buddhist priesthood, who do not, or at least should not, eat animal food. We now sallied forth in a body to fight the wild boars. But the night was so dark that we could see nothing in the bamboo ravines, and, perhaps, the noise made by about thirty priests and servants warned the animals to retire to the brushwood, higher up the hills. Be that as it may, we could neither see nor hear anything of them, and I confessed I was rather glad than otherwise, as I thought there was a considerable chance of my shooting, by mistake, a priest instead of a wild boar. The priests have two modes of protecting their property from the ravages of these animals. Deep pits are dug on the hillsides, and as there are springs in almost all these places, the pits are scarcely finished before they are half full of water. The mouth of each pit is then covered over with a quantity of sticks, rubbish, and grass to attract the animal. And no sooner does he begin to bore into it with his snout than the hole gives way and he is plunged head foremost into the pit from which it is quite impossible for him to extricate himself. And he is either drowned or becomes an easy prey to the Chinese. These pits are most dangerous traps to persons unacquainted with the localities in which they are placed. I had several narrow escapes, and once in particular, when coming out of a dense mass of brushwood, I stepped unawares on the treacherous mouth of one of them and felt the ground under my feet actually giving way. But managing to throw my arms forward, I caught hold of a small twig which was growing near, and by this means supported myself until I was able to scramble onto firmer ground. On turning back to examine the place, I found that the loose rubbish had sunk in, and a deep pit, half full of water, was exposed to my view. The pit was made narrow at the mouth and widening inside, like a great china vase, being constructed in this manner to prevent the boar from scrambling out when once fairly in it. Had I fallen in, it would have been next to impossible to have extricated myself without assistance, and as the pits are generally dug in the most retired and wild part of the mountains, my chance would have been a bad one. There are a large number of Buddhist temples scattered all over this part of the country, one named Ayu Wang, which I also visited, is like Tian Tong of great extent and seemingly well supported. They both have large tracts of land in the vicinity of the monasteries and have numerous small temples in different parts of the district which are under their control. All the temples, both large and small, are built in the most romantic and beautiful situations amongst the hills, and the neighboring woods are always preserved and encouraged. 
What would indicate the residence of a country gentleman in England is in China the sign of a Buddhist temple, and this holds good over all the country. When the weary traveler, therefore, who has been exposed for hours to the fierce rays of an eastern sun, sees a large, clean-looking house showing itself amongst the trees on the distant hillside, he may be almost certain that it is one of Buddha's temples, where the priests will treat him not only with courtesy, but with kindness. Puto, or Worshipping Island, as it is commonly called by foreigners, is one of the eastern islands in the Zhoushan Archipelago, and seems to be the capital or stronghold of Buddhism in this part of China. This island is not more than five or six miles in circumference, and, although hilly, its sides and small ravines are pretty well wooded, particularly in the vicinity of the numerous temples. As it is only a few hours' sail from Zhou Shan, it has been visited at different times by a number of our officers during the war, all of whom spoke highly of its natural beauties and richness of vegetation. I therefore determined to visit the place in order to judge for myself, and accordingly set out in July 1844, accompanied by my friend Mr. Maxwell of the Madras Army. Leaving Joshan at night with the tide in our favor, we reached the island at sunrise on the following morning. We landed and pursued our way over a hill and down on the other side by a road which led us into a beautiful and romantic glen. It is here that the principal group of temples is built, and when we first caught glimpse of them, as we wended our way down the hill, they seemed like a town of considerable size. As we approached nearer, the view became highly interesting. In front, there was a large artificial pond, filled with the broad green leaves and noble red and white flowers of the Nelumbium speciosum, a plant in high favor with the Chinese. Everybody who went to Putua admired these beautiful water lilies. In order to reach the monastery, we crossed a very ornamental bridge built over this pond, which, when viewed in a line with an old tower close by, has a pretty and striking appearance. The temples or halls which contain the idols are extremely spacious and resemble those which I have already described at Tian Tong and Ayuwang. These idols, many of which are 30 or 40 feet in height, are generally made of wood or clay and then richly gilt. There is one small temple, however, of a very unassuming appearance where we met with some exquisite bronze statues which would be considered of great value in England. These, of course, were much smaller than the others, but viewed as works of art, they were by far the finest which I saw during my travels in China. Having examined these temples, we pursued our way towards another assemblage of them, about two miles to the eastward and close on the seashore. We entered the courts through a kind of triumphal arch, which looks out upon the sea, and found that these temples were constructed upon the same plan as all the others. As we had determined to make this part of the island our home during our stay, we fixed upon the cleanest-looking temple and asked the high priest to allow us, without farther delay, to put our beds and traveling baggage into it. On the following day, we inspected various parts of the island. Besides the large temples just noticed, there are about 60 or 70 smaller ones built on all the hillsides, each of which contains three or four priests who are all under the superior or abbot who resides near one of the large temples. Even on the top of the highest hill probably 1,500 or 1,800 feet above the level of the sea, we found a temple of considerable size and in excellent repair. There are winding stone steps from the sea beach all the way up to this temple, and a small resting place about halfway up the hill where the wary devotee may rest and drink of the refreshing stream, which flows down the sides of the mountain, and in the little temple close at hand, which is also crowded with idols, he can supplicate Buddha for strength to enable him to reach the end of his journey. We were surprised to find a Buddhist temple in such excellent order as the one on the summit of the hill proved to be in. It is a striking fact that almost all these places are crumbling fast into ruins. There are a few exceptions in cases where they happen to get a good name amongst the people from the supposed kindness of the gods, but the great mass are in a state of decay. From the upper temple on Putuoshan, the view is strikingly grand. Rugged mountains are seen rising one above another and capped with clouds. Hundreds of islands, some fertile, others rocky and barren, lay scattered over the sea. When we looked in one direction amongst the islands, the water was yellow and muddy. But to the eastward, the deep blue ocean had resumed its usual color, and the line between the yellow waters and the blue was distinctly and curiously marked. 
The island of Putuo is set apart entirely as a residence for the priests of the Buddhist religion. Few other persons are allowed to live there, and these are either servants or in some way connected with the priests. No women are permitted to reside on the island, it being against the principles of the Buddhists to allow their priests to marry. The number of priests are estimated at 2,000, but many of them are constantly absent on begging expeditions for the support of their religion. This establishment, like Tiantong, has also a portion of land allotted to it for its support, and the remainder of the funds are made up by the subscriptions of the devotees. On certain high days, at different periods of the year, many thousands of both sexes, but particularly females, resort to these temples, clad in their best attire, to pay their vows and engage in the other exercises of heathen worship. Little stalls are then seen in the temples or at the doorways for the sale of incense, candles, paper made up in the form of the ingots of sissy silver, and other holy things which are considered acceptable offerings to the gods and are either consumed in the temples or carried home to bring a blessing upon the houses and families of those who purchase them. The profits of these sales, of course, go to the support of the establishment. When we consider that these poor, deluded people sometimes travel a distance of several hundred miles to worship in the temples of Putoshan and other celebrated places, we cannot but admire their spirit of devotion. I was once staying in the temple of Tiantong when it was visited for three days by devotees from all parts of the country. As they line the roads on their way to the temple, clad in the graceful and flowing costume of the East, the mind was naturally led back to those days of scripture history, when Jerusalem was in its glory, and the Jews, the chosen people of God, came from afar to worship in its temple. Although no Christian can look upon the priests and devotees of the Buddhist creed without an eye of pity, yet he must give them credit for their conduct, since he has every reason to believe them sincere. And I am inclined to believe that justice has not been done them in this respect. Mr. Gutzloff, in describing his visit to Putuo, is of a different opinion. He says, quote, We were present at the Vespers of the priests, which they chanted in the Bali language, not unlike the Latin service of the Romish church. They held rosaries in their hands, which rested upon their breasts. One of them had a small bell by the tinkling of which their service was regulated, and they occasionally beat the drum and large bell to rouse Buddha's attention to their prayers. The same words were a hundred times repeated. None of the officiating persons showed any interest in the ceremony, for some were looking around laughing and joking, while others muttered their prayers. The few people who were present, not to attend the worship but to gaze at us, did not seem, in the least degree, to feel the solemnity of the service. End quote. What Mr. Gutzloff says is doubtless true, but after residing for months in their temples at different times and in different parts of the country, I have no hesitation in saying that such conduct is far from being general. In certain instances, I have seen it myself, but this levity and apparent want of attention was exhibited by the servants and lookers-on, who were taking no part in the ceremony, and not by the respectable portion of the priests. On the contrary, I have generally been struck with the solemnity with which their devotional exercises were conducted. I have often walked into Chinese temples when the priests were engaged in prayer, and although there would have been some apology for them had their attention been diverted, they went on in the most solemn manner until the conclusion of the service, as if no foreigner were present. They then came politely up to me, examining my dress and everything about me with the most earnest curiosity. Nor does this apply to priests only. The laity, and particularly the female sex, seem equally sincere when they engage in their public devotions. Whether they are what they appear to be, or how often they are in this pious frame of mind, are questions which I cannot answer. Before judging harshly of the Chinese, let the reader consider what effect would be produced upon the members of a Christian church by the unexpected entrance of a small-footed Chinese lady, or a Mandarin with the gold button and peacock feather mounted on his hat, and his long tail dangling over his shoulders. I am far from being an admirer of the Buddhist priesthood. They are generally an imbecile race, and shamefully ignorant of everything but the simple forms of their religion, but nevertheless... There are many traits of their character not unworthy of imitation. There are two other sects in China, namely the followers of Kung Fu Tzu, or Confucius, and the sect of Tao, or Reason. 
although these three sects form the principal part of the population, it is well known that there are a great number of Mohammedans in every part of the empire who are not only tolerated, but admitted to offices under government in the same manner as the members of the three established sects. Jews are also found in several districts, but more particularly at a place called Kaifeng in the province of Henan. The various religious ceremonies which the Chinese are continually performing prove at least that they are very superstitious. In all the southern towns, every house has its temple or altar, both inside and outside. The altar in the inside is generally placed at the end of the principal hall or shop, as the case may be, raised a few feet from the ground and having some kind of representation of the family deity placed upon it. This is surrounded with gaudy tinsel paper, and on the first of the Chinese month or other high days, candles and incense are burned on the table which is placed in front of it. The altar on the outside of the door resembles a little furnace in which the same ceremonies are regularly performed. In the vicinity of small villages and sometimes in the most retired situations, the stranger meets with little joss houses or temples gaudily decorated with paintings and tinsel paper and and stuck round about with the remains of candles and sticks of incense. In almost all Chinese towns, there are shops for the sale of idols of all kinds and sizes, varying in price from a few cash to a very large sum. Many of those exposed for sale are of great age and have evidently changed hands several times. I am inclined to believe that the Chinese exchange those gods which do not please them for others of higher character in which they suppose are more likely to grant an answer to their prayers or bring prosperity to their homes or their villages. The periodical offerings to the gods are very striking exhibitions to the stranger who looks upon them for the first time. When staying at Shanghai in November 1844, I witnessed the most curious spectacle in the house where I was residing. It was a family offering to the gods. Early in the morning, the principal hall in the house was set in order. A large table was placed in the center and shortly afterwards covered with small dishes filled with the various articles commonly used as food by the Chinese. All these were the very best description which could be procured. After a certain time had elapsed, a number of candles were lighted and columns of smoke and fragrant odors began to rise from the incense which was burning on the table. All the inmates of the house and their friends were clad in their best attire, and in turn came to kotow, or bow lowly, and repeatedly in front of the table and the altar. The scene, although it was an idolatrous one, seemed to me to have something very impressive about it, and whilst I pitied the delusion of our host and his friends, I could not but admire their devotion. In a short time after the ceremony was completed, a large quantity of tinsel paper, made up in the form and shape of the ingots of sissy silver common in China, was heaped on the floor in front of the tables. The burning incense was then taken from the table and placed in the midst of it, and the whole consumed together. By and by, when the gods were supposed to have finished their repast, all the articles of food were removed from the tables, cut up, and consumed by people connected with the family. On another occasion, when at Ningbo, having been out some distance in the country, it was night and dark before I reached the east gate of the city, near which I was lodged in the house of a Chinese merchant. The city gates were closed, but two or three loud knocks soon brought the warder, who instantly admitted me. I was now in the widest and finest street in the city, which seemed in a blaze of light and unusually lively for any part of a Chinese town after nightfall. The sounds of music fell upon my ear, the gong, the drum, and the more plaintive and pleasing tones of several wind instruments. I was soon near enough to observe what was going on and saw, at a glance, that it was a public offering to the gods, but far grander and more striking than I had ever witnessed. The table was spread in the open street, and everything was on a large and expensive scale. Instead of small dishes, whole animals were sacrificed on the occasion. A pig was placed on one side of the table and a sheep on the other. The former scraped clean in the usual way, and the latter skinned. The entrails of both were removed, and on each were placed some flowers, an onion, and a knife. The other parts of the table groaned with all the delicacies in common use amongst the respectable portion of the Chinese, such as fowls, ducks, numerous compound dishes, fruits, vegetables, and rice. Chairs were placed at one end of the table on which the gods were supposed to sit during the meal, and chopsticks were regularly laid at the sides of the different dishes. 
A blaze of light illuminated the whole place, and the smoke of the fragrant incense rose up into the air in wreaths. At intervals, the band struck up their favorite plaintive national airs, and altogether the whole scene was one of the strangest and most curious which it has ever been my lot to witness. There was another ceremony of a religious character which I frequently observed in the northern cities. I allude to processions in honor of the gods. I saw one of them at Shanghai, which must have been at least a mile in length. The gods, or josses, were dressed up in the finest silks and carried about in splendid sedan chairs, preceded and succeeded by their numerous devotees, superbly dressed for the occasion and bearing the different badges of office. The dresses of the officials were exactly the same of those who formed the train of some of the high mandarins. Some had a broad fan made of peacock feathers, which they wore on the sides of their hats. Others were clad in glaring theatrical dresses with low caps and two long black feathers stuck in them and hanging over their shoulders like two horns. Then there were the ill-looking executioners with long, conical, black hats on their heads and whips in their hands for the punishment of the refractory. Bands of music placed in different parts of the procession played at intervals as it proceeded. Anxious to see the end of this curious exhibition, I followed the procession until it arrived at a temple in the suburbs where it halted. The gods were taken out of the sedan chairs and replaced with due honors in the temple from which they had been taken in the morning. Here their numerous votaries bent low before them, burned incense, and left their gifts upon the altar. Numerous groups of well-dressed ladies and their children were scattered over the ground in the vicinity of the temple, all bending their knees and seemingly engaged in earnest devotion. A large quantity of paper, in the form of the sissy ingots, was heaped up on the grass as it was brought by the different devotees, and, when the ceremonies of the day were drawing to a close, the whole was burned in honor of, or as an offering to, the gods. The sight was interesting, but it was one which no Christian could look upon without feelings of the deepest commiseration. In the course of my travels in China, I have often met with Christian missionaries, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, who have been laboring amongst the Chinese for years. Until very lately, the efforts of the Protestants had been chiefly confined to Macau and Canton. Since the war, however, they have had an opportunity of extending their operations, and some are now settled at all the new ports which have been opened for foreign trade, as well as on our island of Hong Kong, which will now become their headquarters. The medical missionaries also act in conjunction with the others, and are of great use in curing many of the diseases which prevail in the country, while at the same time the truths of the Christian faith are presented to the minds of their patients. Dr. Lockhart of the London Missionary Society, who had established himself in the town of Shanghai, had his hospital daily crowded with patients, many of whom had come from very distant parts of the country. All were attended to in the most skillful and careful manner, without money and without price. The Reverend Mr. Medhurst, who has labored long and zealously as a Christian missionary in the East, was also at Shanghai. This gentleman is well known as an eminent Chinese scholar, and besides preaching to the people in their own tongue, he has a printing establishment with Chinese type, continually at work for the dissemination of the truths of the gospel. Several other gentlemen and their families had arrived at the same port previous to my departure and were closely engaged in the study of the language. Ningpo and Amoy were also occupied by missionaries, both from England and America, and I suppose, here this time, some have also reached Fuzhou on the River Min. From my own experience of Chinese character, and from what I have seen of the working of the Medical Missionary Society, I am convinced that it must be a powerful auxiliary to the missionaries in the conversion of the Chinese. I regret, however, to say that, up to the present time, little progress appears to have been made. One portion of the people, and a large one, is entirely indifferent to religion of any kind, and the rest are so bigoted and conceited that it will be a most difficult task to convince them that any religion is better or purer than their own. The Roman Catholic missionaries conduct their operations in a manner somewhat different from the Protestants. They do not restrict themselves to the outports of the empire, where foreigners are permitted to trade, but penetrate into the interior and distribute themselves all over the country. One of their bishops, an Italian nobleman, resides in the province of Jiangsu, a few miles from Shanghai, where I have frequently met him. He dresses in the costume of the country and speaks the language with the most perfect fluency. In the place where he lives, he is surrounded by his converts. 
In fact, it is a little Christian village where he is perfectly safe, and I believe is seldom, if ever, annoyed in any way by the Chinese authorities. When new Roman Catholic missionaries arrive, they are met by some of their brethren or their converts at the port nearest their destination and secretly conveyed into the interior. The Chinese dress is substituted for the European, their heads are shaved, and in this state they are conducted to the scene of their future labors, where they commence the study of the language, if they have not learned it before, and in about two years are able to speak it sufficiently well to enable them to instruct the people. These poor men submit to many privations and dangers for the cause they have espoused, and although I do not approve of the doctrines which they teach, I must give them the highest praise for enthusiasm and devotion to their faith. European customs, habits, and luxuries are all abandoned from the moment they put their feet on the shores of China. Parents, friends, and home, in many instances, are heard of no more. Before them lies a heathen land of strangers, cold and unconcerned about the religion for which they themselves are sacrificing everything, and they know that their graves will be far away from the land of their birth and the home of their early years. They seem to have much of the spirit and enthusiasm of the first preachers of the Christian religion when they were sent out into the world by their divine master to preach the gospel to every creature and to obey God rather than man. According to the accounts of these missionaries, the number of converts to their faith is very considerable, but I fear they, as well as the Protestants, are often led away by false appearances and assertions. Many of the Chinese are unprincipled and deceitful enough to become Christians, or in fact anything else, in name, to accomplish the object they may have in view, and they would become Buddhists the very next day should any inducement be offered them to do so. Judging from appearances, the day must yet be very distant when the Chinese, as a nation, will be converted to the Christian faith. Could those individuals in our time who predict the near approach of the millennium see the length and breadth of this vast country with its 300 millions of souls? They would surely pause and reflect before they publish their absurd and foolish predictions. Well, that's it for... This week's episode, not a bad one. Let me explain a couple things before we sign off. Fortune mentions Tiantong Temple, the Temple of Heavenly Boys. This place is still around today, about 45 minutes east of Ningbo, located in the beautiful Tiantong Country Park, Tiantong Sunlin Gongyuan. This temple kind of becomes Fortune's office, and he returns there many times in his travels to the tea country of Zhejiang, he also mentions Ayuwang Temple. This isn't terribly far from Tiantong Temple, maybe about 20 minutes north, 12 kilometers through the hills and forests. This temple is named for the great Indian king Ashoka, who reigned 268 to 232 BCE. It was built during the Western Jin in the year 282, but what you can see today was rebuilt during the Qing Dynasty. If you ever find yourself in Ningbo, these are a couple of sites you can knock out in a day. Robert Fortune sure had a lot of guts. I mean, once you left the safety of the treaty ports and the city center, travelers really took their life in their hands. Those local thugs who were trying to roll Fortune while he was out on one of his strolls outside Canton, quote, examining the botanical productions, as he said, was a good example. That was quite a close call. I'm sure you can get an idea of how lawless and dangerous these times were for foreigners in China, and especially Europeans. It was as if a contest was always going on to see who could show the most amount of contempt for each other. I'm sure the Westerners, traders, missionaries, and people like Fortune wore out their welcome in China minutes after the Treaty of Nanjing was signed. It's no surprise to hear how much resentment and violence there was directed against foreigners in the towns and villages in China where they pass through. Fortune also mentions Sissy Silver. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but in Mandarin it's called Xi Si, which translates to fine silk. What this is, people who have been around Chinatown jewelry stores and in the Chinese-speaking world have seen these things. They are these boat-shaped ingots of gold or silver. It's a symbol of wealth and this way of shaping silver and gold ingots has been around since the days of Qin Shi Huang. They're also called yuan bao. Fortune saw these things and noticed 
when Chinese made offerings to their ancestors, they would burn these boat-shaped ingots made out of paper. In Cantonese, it's called Sai Si, but don't quote me on those tones. Fortune spells it S-Y-C-E-E. I'm not sure if you caught that, but he mentioned the Jews of Kaifeng. That subject was discussed in CHP episode 112, I guess in his day, mid-1800s. The fame of this Jewish community in Kaifeng was known, however, if you recall from the episode, this community had seen better days and was almost gone. He sure had a lot to say about Christianity's prospects in China. Not terribly optimistic, though he had plenty of nice things to say about some of the missionaries. So that's what I have for you this time. I have a whole lot more Robert Fortune to go before we move on to other antiquarian gems I have saved up for all y'alls. Next episode, we're going to take a look at tea and Robert Fortune's observations made on this subject, something he was eminently qualified for, being a first-rate botanist and all. The China Vintage Hour is brought to you by Teacup Media, the very same platform that brings you the Chinese Sayings podcast and the long-running, award-winning China History podcast. Check them all out at teacup.media. Let me say that again. That's teacup.media. Until then, this is your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, wishing you my very best and hoping maybe you'll consider joining me next time for some more 19th century fun and excitement romping through China with Mr. Robert Fortune here at the China Vintage Hour. Take care, everyone.